what I'm proposing to do is that <laughs> we'll probably finish this in about 45 minutes. And I believe our schedule um, was for about an hour. Um, so what I'd like to propose, we'll try and finish around 345, um, which is 145 here. Um, and then that will mean we'll shift our break up um, um, to start at, at 345 to, um, I guess, 415. And then we'll start module eight at 415, if that's okay with everyone. Nia, do you have that info just to sort of keep me on track here? <laughs> Sorry, when would you like to take the break? Um, so we'll take uh, it at 45. 45. <laughs> Right. I don't know if we actually need a 30 minute break, so we might shorten it a little bit and then maybe we could think about starting it um, for um, 415 or 410 for module eight. Sounds good. All right. Um, so we'll jump into this. And so what we're going to do is um, we've been focusing on Keras and SKLearn and we, we showed how we could use Keras and SKLearn um, in the non-bioinformatic problem of, of iris classification. So what I wanted to do here was just to sort of illustrate how we could do the same thing for, for secondary structure prediction. And so that was the work that we did in module four yesterday, just as a reminder. So um, this is what we're going to do. We're, we're building Keras, and this is a set of slides that we've seen before uh, in terms of defining the problem. So how do I predict secondary structure? We talked about the secondary structure prediction issues, and again, just reminders about uh, it's identifying uh, helices, beta strands, and coils. Helices are those sort of yellowish orange uh, coils. Uh, beta strands are the, the blue parts, and the black ones are the coil regions. Uh, we have a, a training set, and if you recall, yesterday we used this thing called PPTDB, which has a large collection of secondary structures. Um, and sequences for thousands of proteins in the protein data bank. Um, we've had the same set as the original uh, NumPy version, um, pure Python version that we have. So this also is from what you saw yesterday. And what we're gonna do is, is go through the standard machine learning workflow, um, which is to transform the data and train our model. So again, as a reminder, if we pretend that our sequence is just made up of three letters, um, uh, alanine, cysteine, glycine, uh, we talked about the one-hot encoding. We talked about how we would have a, an output. In this case, it's beta strand, coil, and helix. So three instead of coding and non-coding. Um, and we have a sliding window where we're moving along. In this case, at you know three residues at a time. So three residues it produces a vector, in this case of nine, and an output a vector of, of two bits. So that's the general model. Um, of course, we were using much wider um, windows and, and a different alphabet, but that was conceptually what we're trying to do. So if you go to module seven, just as we've done with all the other modules, you'll be able to find some of the same code that I'll talk about. Uh, you can pop it up and look on your screens, or you can just follow along with the slides here. Um, again, we're looking at the Python version. And then if you look at the code, uh, you see that we're importing um, NumPy and Pandas as we've done for every other uh, Python code that we've, we've built here. Um, you'll also recall that we had uh, functions to um, read uh, the data files. Um, and this is exactly the same code that we used in the um, module four. And you'll see that the same thing happened when we did the neural net programming for the iris one. We used all of the um, reading infrastructure file reading that we had previously built. And that really the, the Keras part came in when we were trying to do the artificial net um, neural net training and, and design. So the same thing is happening here. We're, we're using original code that we wrote to read the data sets um, and to uh, read the sequence and the secondary structure. Same code used again, which is to check for invalid amino acids. So this is what we did last time. And um, again, it's just good coding practice to always check. We're looking for things like X 
where the amino acid is it known and flag it. Uh, we're doing uh, values, the label check, the same thing that we've done with every data set uh, pretty much that we've had before, um, which is again, good coding practice. Always make sure that you've got clean data to work with. Um, same thing as before in terms of creating a training and a testing set. Uh, we did a 70-30 split. Um, and um, that's same code as, as previously used. Um, we also have to do some transformation feature selection. Um, so this is where we once again use one-hot encoding. And recall that we did the one-hot encoding for the neural net for the iris stuff also when we used Keras. So we're using the same one-hot encoding here, and we're also using the null characters. So our alphabet is 21 amino acids, not 20, with the extra amino acid being called null. Um, and then we're using the same binary encoding or pseudo-binary encoding for the three secondary structures, beta sheet, coil, and helix. Um, this, again, is the same code that we used um, yesterday to create that um, one-hot encoding for amino acid sequences and um, uh, that binary structure, and then the same code used as yesterday uh, to create um, the B, C, and H encoding. Null padding is used, same thing. Um, this is both for beginning and end, uh, so that as we scan this residue window of 17 amino acids, we can uh, make predictions for the first and last amino acids in the protein sequence. Um, reason for the windowing is exactly the same as we talked about before, that secondary structure has context. Um, so having information about the residues immediately around another one and usually looking up to eight residues either way, tells you a lot about the likelihood of, of having a secondary structure. And this context is, is important. That's why we have windows. And it's why with the genome work, when we had a window size of seven, nine, or any higher, we didn't get great results because gene context is much, much longer. Um, you know, genes are thousands of bases long. Secondary structures, on average are about um, 10 to 15 residues long. So this is why this window windowing method works for protein secondary structure and why it generally failed for uh, gene identification. So if we had you know, spans that were a thousand bases or longer um, for a gene prediction, we might've been able to do better, but then the, the data sizes and files would become unwieldy which is why we went to a feature-based model as opposed to a, um, a, a string-based model. But string-based models were fine for secondary structure prediction. This is what we're using. Again, it's a reminder about how we encoded things. So this is you know, similar code, identical code, again, a rationale that we saw before. So it's probably why I'm, I'm racing through it, but at least seeing it a second time for you guys might help make more sense. So we're padding residues with null residues, eight re null residues at the beginning, eight null residues at the end. And we then have our window. This is a smaller window than 17, but we're just drawing along and we um, predict the secondary structure based on the middle one. So this is a categorization problem, H, B, and C. We talked last time about regression. Uh, we're not trying to predict numbers, we're just trying to predict categories, just like flower categories, coding categories, secondary structure categories. And this is just highlighting is that we move the window along and then we um, have an input X and an output Y and, and progress from X plus one, X plus two, X plus three, all the way through. We also, if you recall, we were encoding these amino acids. So the one hot encoding um, for null is zero, 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 20 with zeros and a one. We had different ones for amino acids, A, C, D, and so on. And this is just the code that we used. Um, this is the windowing, but then as we described yesterday, we took all 17 
uh, amino acids in the window, and we ended up with 21 um, bit vectors describing each amino acid. And so we end up having um, a 357 win bit long vector, which describes each window. And then of course, if we have you know, 100 residues in the protein, it's 357 times 100 um, that we would have in this um, ultimate input. And this, as we call uh, in machine learning, it's flattening. So we don't want a 21 by 17 matrix, we just want a one by 357 vector. Does that make sense to everyone? So here's what our flattened vector look like, looks like. Obviously it's slide is too small um, to be able to put out 357 characters, but I think um, you can see how we've mapped all of these um, amino acid um, vectors of 21 and to made it one to one long vector. Um, and then we just do the shifting from one residue at a time to create another vector. And if the sequence is 100 residues, we do it 100 times. And we have vectors of 357 times 100. So that's the windowing method that we're using. Again, it's a repeat from what was done before. Um, this is our encoding. This is what our input looks like. So we've got 357 bits times L, which is the length of the sequence. And then we have output data, which is combinations of um, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 to describe the secondary structure. And again, that would be a length of L, but the vectors for, for these are just three bits long. So the windowing method um, and the transformation of the binary encoding is, is done through this code. This is what you saw yesterday as well. So it's it's no different. If you're not clear about how it was done, um, then um, read the code a little bit more and you can ask the TAs about some of the specifics of this code. The padding is where we're putting um, the uh, null sequence um, to the beginning and to the end. Um, and then we do our flattening. Um, and that's the encoded protein set and the concatenated sequences. Same thing was done for the secondary structure. Um, and remember we're looking for uh, three characters, B, C, and H, and they're encoded as binaries. So all of that is, is text or code that we wrote yesterday. Nothing is any different just as it was with the IRIS program um, with the neural net where we had to basically use exactly the same code to read and one hot encode um, the IRIS data. So this is our neural net. Um, so there's an input layer of 357 units, but what we're doing now is using Keras and this is where we can you know, avoid some of the challenges of the gradient descent methods and the derivative, derivatives and the biases and other things that we had to deal with. Um, and we can actually add you know, more hidden layers because we had a, a very modest number of hidden layers with our original neural net. So uh, just as we did with the program that was done for um, the neural net for the irises, we're importing Keras and we're importing the two modules, dense and sequential. Sequential is to make the framework of the neural net and dense is to help form those connections and add in whatever number of layers we want. So the sequential function, so remember there's sequential and there's dense. Um, so the add gives us an input layer and a hidden layer. And with the iris, just as with the iris, we're going to use the ReLU function um, for activation. We're not using the sigmoidal or softmax, um, but that's, again, the same code. We're using six units, uh, six layers, uh, just as we did for the iris one. 
Uh, we can obviously add more layers if we want, um, but we've chosen six. Um, this is how you guys can interactively play with the code, and that's what we'll do in the, in the lab at the end of this. Same thing, which was done with the neural net for the um, iris one. We're using compile to put the layers together. Uh, we have an optimizer function, which is um, um, used to, to choose and optimize the learning rates for each of the parameters. And then we have a fit method to initiate training. So again, a huge shrinkage in terms of the amount of code that was needed um, because we're just using these Keras functions. And this is where it's, I guess I'll have to ask Mark again, maybe to send me some higher resolution image because this got somehow corrupted. <laughs> um, so uh, we're using the predict method to allow us to both um, test and validate it. And so the predict calls a test set of inputs. Uh, the resulting array gives us the probabilities of B, C, and H in each of the test set. So Mark, do you, are you there? I'm not sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Generate that image because I just I don't yes. know why these things suddenly lost resolution when we um, did them. Um, we also have to create our confusion matrix. Um, so we're trying to predict the probability of each row in the minute matrix, and then we compare them to the actual structures, which we got from the PPTDB. Um, so when we wrote the original pure Python uh, secondary structure prediction with the neural nets, this is the confusion matrix we got. So you know, it's not what we saw in the irises, which is you know one one one. This is beta sheet prediction. This is coil prediction. This is helix prediction. So sixty nine percent, sixty five percent, forty six percent, with an overall average I think of around sixty one or sixty two percent. The the best secondary structure prediction programs are hovering around seventy or seventy five percent. Although now with alpha fold, it's around you know, ninety five percent. But in the old days, this is what this is. You know, pretty good. This is not great. And it's because we haven't used encoding functions. We haven't used features. Um, but that's just to sort of give you a little bit of context about the overall performance. Uh, good, but not great is how I'd call it. Here's the one with the uh, Keras. So we can compare. Um, so our beta prediction is a little worse, but our coil prediction is a little better. And our helix prediction is a little better. And I think some of the other ones in terms of um, the off diagonal elements are close or about the same. And we should expect that um, outside of just the fact that we changed the um, activation function from a sigmoidal or softmax to um, a relu function might be the only reason why there are some differences. Um, and then this is just comparing the statistics. Um, so with the um, um, Python version of the secondary structure where we're using Keras, um, the total number of coding lines um, is about 240. To run the program, it's about a minute. Interestingly, and this was a surprise to all of us, when we moved to the R program, and rather than using Keras, but using the deep net um, functions that are available in R, you know, first number of lines shrunk, but more impressive, the, the time was, was much, much shorter. And I say, this is a pleasant surprise. Um, as I say, normally R is a much slower um, running program than Python. But this is one of those examples where actually Python is actually faster. The key thing, and uh, key element with the statistics is that the Keras program is much, much shorter than the original um, secondary structure neural net. Um, so we trained, as I said, and this is done with the original one with pure Python. It was 490 proteins that were trained on uh, or tested. Uh, and then the, the validation set was 210. Um, 
I think what I may not have emphasized very much is that this code for doing secondary structure prediction could also be trained or adapted to find, say, membrane spanning regions in proteins or signal sites, um, uh, or maybe even epitopes of B and T cells. So the code itself is, is fairly generic. Um, it's basically looking for patterns. All that you have to do is generate uh, training data and to either find it or assemble it yourself. Um, so that's pretty much a summary of, of the, the integration with, with Keras um, in the secondary structure prediction.